Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. I suppose I wanted to start again by, by saying, you know, in order to set this up, to kind of just go back briefly to the text of Lincoln's second inaugural. And if you look on, uh, you look on the manuscript here, you say, uh, uh, yet if God wills it, uh, yet if God wills that it continue, it being the war, until all the wealth uh, piled, by, piled by the landsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn uh, with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, uh, so uh, shall, shall it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true, mishpatim uh, aranai be'emet, and righteous altogether. Now, it's interesting about Lincoln, that Lincoln grew up, you know, Lincoln was a 19th century equivalent of a secular humanist. But as I say, Lincoln's, uh, you know, Lincoln seems not to have been religiously orthodox in the conventional meaning of the term, but he grew up in a deeply Protestant environment uh, and was kind of imbued with its values and therefore knew how to impart a moral judgment uh, to the meaning of the Civil War. Um, and of course, the whole point of this sentence is to say that Civil War, by its very definition, uh, is, uh, you know, was, was, a, was a great tragedy. Uh, and, but whatever price white Americans have to pay, uh, North and South alike, uh, for, two, you know, for a quarter millennium of uh, enforced labor uh, and chattel, uh, chattel slavery, you know, the, in, you know the, the judgments of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. There could be no really detracting morally from that judgment. But the, so that by itself, we might say, is a sufficient tragedy. Or if, if we want to say the Civil War is a tragic event, that by itself states you know, one significant part of the tragedy. But of course, the other part of the tragedy, which I, which I tried to mention the other day, and I want to go ahead and uh, develop more this morning, uh, is that I think the failure of Reconstruction was a great tragedy for the American people and the American nation over the next century. Uh, and asking why Reconstruction failed and trying to make sense of you know, how, how do we define failure uh, was the significance of that failure. It's, it seems to me that's a kind of moral question that lurks behind or underlies the kind of constitutional arguments uh, that, we want to, that we want to make. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go along uh, this morning uh, because the, you know, the, the failure of Reconstruction, the return of uh, rule to, the, you know, to a kind of white elite in the, you know, kind of in, in, in the post-Reconstruction South, you know, consigned, America, you know, consigned Americans to another, you know, to decades more of... Um, you know, uh, you know, whole, whole society laboring under the burden of racial segregation and therefore made possible the second Reconstruction in the 1960s, which I remember well from being a boy. In fact, talked about, I meant to talk about this briefly when I was in my high school uh, a week ago. Okay, so that's the a, that's a kind of point of departure. Now, the basic thing I want to raise this morning is that we should think about Reconstruction. We should think about the enactment of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments from 1865 to 1870. Uh, as, as the equivalent of a second founding, uh, equivalent in some respects to the original founding of the 1780s. And this by itself is a controversial, controversial position over which in some ways uh, we're still arguing. And the controversy itself was embedded in the structure of debate uh, from that period. If you think about it, if you guys have looked at or thought about the Shelby County case from a couple of years ago, the voting rights case, you know, where Section 5 was overturned, notwithstanding the fact that Congress had had significant hearings and had decisive majorities to, you know, to reenact, uh, you know, uh, the entire Voting Rights Act. You read, one way to read the Supreme Court's opinion is to say that, you know, what had happened in, in terms of recognizing the importance of racial issues in Reconstruction was in some sense an exception to a larger pattern, that there's a kind of subsisting pattern of American federalism, uh, including, you know, the right of each state to be equally autonomous and all states to be on a part with each other, uh, that at some point deserves restoration, deserves to be, well, reconstructed in its own way. The counter story to that is, no, in fact, we're still dealing with the burdens of history, that in fact, uh, issues that arose in, in the 1860s, 1870s uh, remain with us still, that the fact that large numbers of African Americans vote, which is a big point in Justice Roberts' uh, opinion, that may be significant in and of itself is a way of saying that there's, you know, obviously one aspect of um, having a kind of open uh, 
uh, egalitarian political system in the South has indeed been restored. But there are numerous other ways in which you can manipulate electoral rules, or you know, to borrow the language that I was writing about recently, the times, places, and manners of holding elections can still have really significant consequences for the outcomes. So in a sense, there's an argument going on here about our history. In one, one, one school, I think certainly people on the left, and though I think of myself kind of as, as a centrist, but I think on this issue, I'm probably to the left, uh, would say that it might be better to have a constitutional story that it fully addresses the actual history and is not just worried about you know, existing questions of structure or prior assumptions about what the nature of the federal union was going to be. So that's what I want us to think about you know, is, you know, today and, you know, and, and on Friday when we'll kind of come back and try to wrap up Reconstruction. So here are some general points I think to be made at the very beginning um, about uh, you know, how to think about um, uh, Reconstruction in, you know, in, 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 in a fairly broad context. And then I'll come back and talk in more detail about its very first phase from 1865 to 1866, maybe into 1867 this morning. So the first, as we know from Michael Vorn, uh, well, actually we know from a scholar named Michael Vornberg, you know, the guy whose essay we're reading uh, for section this week, uh, is that the adoption of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery uh, is itself significant, not only because it provides a definitive legal constitutional solution to what you do about slavery, uh, but also because uh, it actually makes the idea that the Constitution is something we can work with again. The Constitution is not simply a great testament handed down to us from the founding generation, which we can only correct in terms of kinds of technical rule changes, which kind of the story of the 11th Amendment, the 12th Amendment. You know, maybe it's the case that the Constitution itself is open to amendment, that we can, in a sense, democratize the Constitution, or at least democratize in the sense of saying, you know, the, the current generation as well as past generations should have the right and the authority to do this. And I want to say something else about Vorenberg. I mean, how many guys have seen Lincoln? You know, so uh, the academic who got credit, or the scholar who got credit for that movie in the credits was Doris Curtin's Goodwin. Uh, she should really be remembered as, as a plagiarist, which is a big part of her career, unfortunately. The person whose work really went into, who really made that story possible, is Michael Vornberg uh, in his book, Final Freedom. And the story Vornberg tells, which is you know, what the movie, in a sense, tries to recapitulate, uh, is, you know, is in fact that this, there, there's a kind of interesting backstory of congressional politics going on here. That, you know, there, it, was, it was by no means clear uh, exactly how uh, the process of emancipation would take place, or you know how you how you would divest uh, slave owners uh, of, uh, of of their property uh, comprehensively, uh, and so you know it's really Vorenberg's book. He didn't get much credit for this, but somebody in the New Republic did more research and realized that really Vorenberg's book was much more of the scholarly basis for the movie than anything else. So he's he's a great scholar, you know, kind of, not a friend of mine, but you know, guy guy I know reasonably well and. Uh, you know, so I think, I think they ought to be mentioned. So the deeper argument he wants to make is that the 13th Amendment is significant at two levels. One, because it provides a specific solution for, okay, we have slavery. It's a, it's a well, it's been a well-encrusted, you know, uh, legal institution. It's evolved, you know, uh, with legislation over a period of 200 years. Um, how do you eliminate definitively? And he tells an interesting political story about what made that possible. Uh, but in doing that, he says that there's also a fundamental shift in attitude about the amendment process. The Constitution is not simply, not simply something Americans have inherited, and the framers are not simply people to whom we always have to pay deference. Uh, it may well be the case that uh, occasions will arise when we're free uh, to rethink the nature of the Union. So that's point number one. Second big point to be made is we have to think a lot, of course. Here, okay, let's move on to the story here. Um, this actually, you know, this actually, well, this, this will come up in a second, but just get a different illustration up here. I'll, I'll come back to this momentarily. Um, but the second thing is we actually flash ahead. We also had the problem of, uh, well, actually, here, let's go back here. Here's Abraham Lincoln. Two photographs from 1858 and 1865. Tells you a lot about how much the presidency ages a person. Also reveals that Lincoln never had a good barber. But it, it, didn't, seem, it didn't seem to matter very much uh, in, ter in, ter in terms of his presidency. Uh, Here's, here's, this is Lincoln shortly before his assassination. This is Le Lincoln touring Richmond and being surrounded, uh, you know, well, both by you know, white, white, soldier, you know, white soldiers from the army, but also by you know, re you know, newly freed African Americans uh, kind, of, kind of flocking to him. Um, the story I want to get to, and I realize my slides are a bit out of sequence here, uh, Link, uh, is to get to this guy, Andrew Johnson. I meant to put in the caption, absolutely the worst president 
uh, the United States has ever had because his actions were so consequential. But Johnson, of course, was an accidental president. I mean, Johnson was a, was a Tennessee unionist and a slave owner uh, who did not join other you know, seceding uh, Southerners. So he remains sitting in the federal Senate in 1864. We, the Republicans put him on the ticket. Uh, and Johnson uh, inherits the presidency after Lincoln's assassination. Uh, he was not, he was by no, since Johnson was a former Democrat, he was hardly, but he was a unionist, so he's hardly a representative spokesman for the Republican Party, which is the dominant political party in the victorious North. Uh, and Johnson shared, uh, you know, although he was a unionist, he was also something of a racist, and he was a slave owner. Uh, he was deeply sympathetic in many ways to uh, the situation of the uh, uh, former existing ruling class in the South. So Johnson's in a position of enormous uh, significance after Lincoln is assassinated, not just because he succeeded Lincoln and personally represents a very different you know, part of the spectrum of American political opinion, but also because, uh, as was customary in the 19th century, uh, con you know, the old Congress would adjourn in um, the spring of an odd-numbered year. And the new Congress would not meet until the end of the calendar year. Of course, the president could always call Congress into session, uh, should he choose to do so, but Johnson chose not to do so. So Johnson has a period of about nine months until the famous 39th Congress assembles, where the discretion of uh, ordering or kind of arranging how Reconstruction or the process of readmitting the South of the Union on the ground is about to take place. Uh, and his, so his role constitutionally is quite significant. Of course, this gets you thinking about the curious nature of our presidential election system. Now, it has been, there have been other occasions in American history where, you know, a lot of, you know, presidents die, it doesn't make, vice president succeeds, doesn't make that big a deal. You know, when, <laughs> when Fillmore succeeded Taylor, you know, it wasn't as if the earth moved and, uh, you know, there were, you know, you know there, there was a, a deep disturbance in the force to use the language of Star Wars. On the other hand, when Truman succeeds Roosevelt, clearly a significant deal. What's back in the news these days is there's a, there's a great book out now by a, really an excellent political historian at Princeton, Julian Zelizer, about the passage of the Civil Rights Act, so, uh, Voting Rights Act of 64, 65, which goes back to think about the role of Lyndon Johnson in Congress and tells more of a congressionally based story than a presidentially driven story about how you get the enactment of that legislation. So, uh, but on, on all, you know, and of course think about Theodore Roosevelt replacing McKinley and so on and so on. But I think of all the president's successions, going back with my theme that the failure of Reconstruction was the great tragedy of American constitutional history, Johnson's being situated in the presidency at this critical moment and g g being able to occupy it for another, uh, well, better part of another four years, you know, really for four years, uh, you know, to the completion of, you know, the term. Uh, was, uh, you know, was another factor. So that's point number, big point number two to be kept in mind. And to think about the constitutional implications of this. Third point, um, you know, Civil War is such a dramatic event, and it's so, it's so central to our political consciousness as Americans, that we wouldn't really compare it to anything else. It's our own tragedy, or it's our own you know, you know, you know, uh, process, uh, you know, to be sorted out primarily in terms of its own history. But in fact, it might be, it's, it, I think it's helpful, particularly in a kind of contemporary perspective, to think about at least two other um, matrices or two other kind of bases of comparison to which the Civil War might be compared. And so that's what I've noted on the outline. One is what we call transitional justice. And transitional justice, I'm sure some of you guys have encountered this in other courses, but transitional justice is the idea of how should legal systems function or legal and political systems function when you've had a significant change in regime, where you've had an authoritarian regime that has uh, presumably committed a number of atrocious acts, uh, and at some point it collapses, it's overthrown, it's replaced uh, by a regime grounded on more liberal, more democratic principles. What should you do at that point? It's by no means an easy question. On the one hand, you have real incentives to pursue justice, uh, to kind of hold those who are accountable for crimes directed against some segment of the population to make them you know, legally accountable or to kind of disable them in some ways or maybe even to prosecute them or even to execute them if, you know, if, if, if that's your taste. Um, so you know, you, you want, on the one hand, you want to hold those who are responsible for uh, acting tyrannically. You want to hold them responsible one way or another, legally responsible as well as morally responsible. On the other hand, you want to have a transition to a more secure, stable, 
society thereafter. Think about this in terms, you know, Madison's notion of, you know, uh, constitutional veneration from Federalist uh, 49 might be, you know, one way to frame this. So there's a, a difficult question about how much do you want to do on the side of justice, how much do you want to do uh, on the side of, you know, having a peaceful transition where you're going to have to, you have to take some measures to accommodate what the bad guys have done, even though they've been displaced from power. How many people do you want to prosecute? How many people do you want to? You know, how many people do you want to bar from a future role in political life? You know, do you want to, Do you want to kind of just work at the top and have some symbolic punishments? Or do you want to penetrate pretty deeply in the political system? That's the situation which confronts the North uh, in the aftermath of 1865. Uh, you know, and the pardon question becomes a sensitive question all along. And actually, if you go back and look at the out the out one I gave, it's something the North had started debating. Uh, you know, pr prior to the end of the Civil War. Uh, and of course, you have different incentives, the incentives of justice and the incentives of accommodation. A second way to think about this, and I think, you know, with the United States coming out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, although that's, that's a, obviously a different situation in some ways, but Reconstruction is upheld for the period when it operates, the dozen or, year or, so, dozen or so years when it operates, it is a regime of military occupation. It does require that you have to, you know, transfer a significant amount of political authority to the military. And that raises lots of difficult questions, particularly in a Republican culture like, well, both Republican lowercase and uppercase, in a Republican culture like ours, uh, how, much political, how much political and legal authority do you, want to, do you want to invest in the Army? We're not very comfortable with that idea. It brings back all kinds of unpleasant memories from 17th century England, for example, uh, from the time of, you know, the late years of Charles II and, you know, the, you know, the brief reign of James II. So there's, you know, there, it's, there are two frameworks here, which I think the Civil War is unique as, as a civil war in terms of our own history, but in, in other ways, if we think about for those who are political science majors, uh, it does belong in the category of other phenomena uh, to which we compare. And then finally, the fourth big factor to be kept in mind is, you know, a significant part of the whole experience of Reconstruction involves changing attitudes towards African Americans in general and the freedmen in particular. And I think that's why, I, let, me, let me go back a bit in, this, in the slides just to get a couple images up here. Um, so if we start with this one, this is a kind of, I can't quite read the date here, but this is, or even, uh, yeah, I can't quite make this out. I have to go back and check it more. But in any case, um, there is a, there's a, a big debate has gone on among historians uh, over the last decade or two about how to think about the process of emancipation broadly defined. If we're strictly constitutional historians, then the big story is the story that Borenberg tells about how do we get to the 13th Amendment as a definitive legal solution. But of course, emancipation is a process that has two prior uh, points of departure. One, of course, is the Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln's incentives for delivery. That, Of course, that relates only to slaves uh, that the North can't reach. It liberates slaves beyond Confederate lines, so its legal efficacy is you know, is not extensive. It's, I mean, it's a promise against the future, but it's not something you can really implement fully at the moment. The second part of this, though, what, what's been controversial is slaves liberate themselves. And how do they do that? As soon as Union armies come near, uh, and not just, you know, arrive at your plantation, but get into the vicinity, uh, slaves are quite ingenious and quite adroit about figuring out ways to, you know, to, you know, to, to, you know, to retreat, I won't say to retreat, to make their way to Union lines. And this is not a new idea in the 1860s. It, I mentioned the other day Alan Taylor's great book that won the Pulitzer last year, The Internal Enemy, where Alan has a really a very, inter very interesting story uh, about uh, you know, the way in which, uh, beginning a bit in the Revolutionary War, but more dramatically with the War of 1812, where the British are reactive in the Chesapeake, and we don't have a navy to keep them out, uh, where a number of African slaves run away and join the British, and they carry with them because African, uh, Alan has a wonderful chapter called Night and Day, or Day and Night, where he shows that who controls the landscape actually varies with the clock. At nighttime, African Americans are out in the countryside. They really know the back roads because they want to visit you know, their wives, their families on other plantations. They want to get together. They really know the countryside. Wartime, that's a great, you know, they probably know it, they may know it better than their masters do in many cases because they've been using it to avoid being detected, so they have to know what the back routes are uh, to avoid slave patrols and the like. So they actually have very valuable strategic knowledge. So that's actually, you know, as Alan suggests, this has been a running theme in African-American history going back at least to the revolution, 
uh, and then War of 1812, and then again, it's, it's revived in the Civil War. It's revived in the Civil War in a massive way. So there's an interesting question among historians. Should we think about emancipation as a process that has, whose its, its, its main vector will be legal constitutional, or don't we really need a kind of social historical explanation of what's going on? Uh, you know, the way in which slaves, in effect, you know, uh, you know uh, liberate themselves. Uh, and I think, of course, that ties in, I think, to, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense, uh, to two larger themes. Uh, one is, you know, I think a fairly obvious thing, that what began as a war for the Union, where Lincoln and other Republicans, <laughs> many Republicans, were happy to say that slavery could survive as a matter of the internal, you know, internal law of the individual states. So, you know, the Republicans do not run on an abolitionist platform in 1861. It's a non-expansionist platform that's the essence of their position. Uh, so it began as a war for the Union, but it does become a war for emancipation. Yes, I think that's a critical fact to understand. So Lincoln's, Lincoln has political calculations in mind with the Emancipation Proclamation, but the understanding, the recognition that the war itself would not be worth the expense of waging it if there were not a fundamental solution to this underlying cancer in the American polity. So in a sense, the war, as often happens in, in wars, the war aims evolve as wars are fought. Uh, so that's a significant factor. But the other side of this, what I call here from patriarchal domination to prejudicial subordination, the other part of the larger Reconstruction story is that a lot of the hopes that were released uh, in the context of you know, the, the mid-1860s actually begin in the, uh, the Carolina Sea Islands, first area to be liberated. Uh, where this, you know, the Willie, uh, late historian Willie Lee Rose has a wonderful book called Rehearsal for Reconstruction, which describes how whites, northern whites, start thinking about, you know, how, you know, what, what, what shall we do with emancipated slaves? How will we make them productive, effective members of society? Um, you know, there's a lot of very generous impulses at work in northern society. On the other hand, northern society in its own way is deeply racist. Uh, it's, you know, and, and we would never want to under, underestimate or devalue that. And the longer the Reconstruction story goes on, let's say the closer you get to 1877, in some ways the more exhausted or, you know, the more disillusioned whites become with the process. So the, the time that Reconstruction ends in 1877, I think whites are willing to kind of leave the question of the future, the future fate of African Americans as a matter for future development. And that's where the debate within the African American com community, say between Booker T. Washington on the one hand and W.B. Du Bois on the other, becomes so significant. Um, so there's, you know, so we, one has to keep racial attitudes uh, in mind here. Okay, so let's see, let me try to remember what's, what slides I have here. Um, you know, part of this process, actually, this, you know, is, is worth recalling, uh, is that, you know, uh, Northern whites have some acquaintance with African Americans. There has been a free black population there. Uh, since the revolution, and it's growing, you know, it is growing in numbers. But the discovery of a slave culture, of large numbers of African Americans living together in enslaved communities, you know, was in a sense sociologically was a matter of discovery. So there's an awful lot of interest in kind of depicting what African American um, uh, families were like. The slave kind of illustrates that. Uh, here's, you know, here's, you know, here's, here's, our guy, here's our guy, Andrew Johnson. Okay. So let's move on to the problem with the presidential reconstruction. Okay, so you know the first big political set of facts to keep in mind is that there is a kind of interregnum, in the sense of Johnson takes over the government, Congress is not meeting, Johnson is the commander in chief of U.S. Armed Forces. He has a lot of he, excuse me, he has a lot of leeway to determine what shape uh, re you know, reconstruction will take uh, initially, uh, and very quickly a set of problems emerge. Uh, that start to define what, you know, Gesundheit, to start to define what the problem is going to be. So the first thing that happens is that, you know, the, the South is beaten, it's, its army disbands and so on. Um, but, you know, much of the old political leadership class is there. It's not as if they're being thro thrown out by the voters. They still have a lot of influence, even in the defeated South. It's not as if, you know, a lower class whites uh, you know, rise up and say, you know, we badly need a change of leadership. So in many ways, you know, so one thing that happens is the old leadership class, the class that led the South into rebellion, is still there. Uh, nor, you know, the question is, you know, what, ha what, ha what will happen if and when these guys come back to Congress? Uh, one thing that complicates this is with the end of slavery, in effect, the end of slavery effectively revokes the three-fifths clause. I mean, it takes till the end of the year to get 
uh, you know, for the 13th Amendment to be ratified. Uh, but uh, once it's ratified, once the legal status of slavery ceases to exist, the South can now count African Americans, can now count the freedmen, or can, well, can now count African Americans not at three fifths, but at five fifths. So Southern representation in the House will actually increase. It seems to be a somewhat perverse result under the circumstances, kind of perverse political consequence. Uh, but that's one aspect of this. Uh, and then finally, you know, so, and, and then also you know, Johnson, you know, on, on the parting issue, uh, Johnson turns out to be a very generous guy. He's not, you know, he's not, he's not, he's not going to attempt to purge uh, the political leadership of the South of its, um, you know, the, you know, the survival of the South. Uh, he's not going to purge or try to remake it. He's pretty generous about, you know, giving pardons. So the perception arises and it's deeply embedded that, in fact, you know, maybe not as much has changed in the South uh, as, as, as might be the case. Uh, and that's reinforced by the emergence of what are called the Black Codes. So there are you know, kind of interim legislatures are meeting in the South. They don't represent African Americans yet. The South has not been reconstructed. Still representing a white, you know, a, a, a kind of dominant white electorate. Uh, so slaves have lost their status as slaves. So a lot of masters find this hard to understand. You know, it's a little hard to kind of come to grips with legal emancipation, but the leading edge of Southern, southern thinking uh, does that. Uh, and in, in effect, what they start doing is they, you know, they, they start drafting, drafting what are called black codes, um, where they try, where they, they have to concede that, that slavery as a legal status is gone, but maybe let's try to find the nearest resemblance there too. And that would be a condition of peonage, uh, P-E-O-N-A-G-E. -E. You know, that's to say, you know, to be a peon is not, is not quite fully as bad as being a slave. Um, but it, it might mean that all kinds of legal restrictions are going to be placed on you in terms of what kinds of ordinary civil rights can you exercise. Um, you know, how free will you be to enter into a labor market? Will you come to enjoy other legal rights? Are there ways to kind of constrain your labor? I mean, the major challenge facing the white planter class is if they want to re restore their plantations, they still need a black labor class to work for them. So you start looking for legal ways. Uh, to make that possible. So here, for example, so here we are just, I mean, I picked this out almost at random, um, but, uh, you know, and I can't remember even where I got this from since it's excerpted, but being an actor, though, Freedmen, Free Negroes, and Mulattoes, kind of interesting group of, you know, the very definitions by itself interesting. Uh, so this, the first part is good. May sue and be sued, implead and be impleaded in all the course of law and equity of the state, and may acquire personal property and, and, uh, that choses? What's that word there? We we'll have to decipher that one later. Uh, I would say causes, but anyhow, in action by dissent or purchase, and may dispose of the same in the same manner to the same extent that white persons may. So that's it. This is actually a step forward, right? This says here is an important set of civil rights relating to your access to, your, to the courts uh, and other rights you can exercise. But then we get a proviso provided that the provisions of this section shall not be so construed as to allow any freedman, free negro, or mulatto to rent or lease any lands or tenements uh, except in incorporated cities or towns, in which places the corporate authorities shall control the same. So it seems to be a right to, you know, to acquire various forms of property is limited in terms of how much land uh, you, can, you can obtain. The, the barrier seems to be prevent negroes from, from, from farming freely in the countryside. Uh, and if, you know, if, if they do acquire lands or tenements and incorporate cities or towns, uh, they shall be, you know, actively controlled by the local corporate authorities. There's a whole array of provisions that are created that effectively limit, you know, they grant nominally some civil rights to it, but the whole animus of this legislation is to turn the freed population into a kind of, you know, agricultural proletariat. Uh, for, you know, for, the, for, for the future years in the South. So that's the kind of second you know, basic condition that arises in 1865. Again, Congress is not meeting. This is all taking place without the Republicans having a direct access, you know, direct, you know, an institution that can effectively enforce their policy. And then third, a big question is left open once, you know, once, once even before the 13th Amendment finally takes effect. 13th Amendment is significant because of section, well, in addition to freeing the slaves, it's significant because of section two. Uh, which says the Congress shall have power to enforce this amendment by appropriate legislation. That section is repeated in the 14th Amendment. I think it's Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, Section 2, 
of the 15th Amendment. So there is an attempt to say, to really to enlarge the Article I, Section 8 authority and jurisdiction of Congress. Congress now has some, you know, Congress is given some capacity to be able to act to, you know, make sure that the process of emancipation is completed. But how far is that process going to go? Is this going to include, you know, as to say, how much can uh, Congress do in order to make sure not simply that African Americans are legally emancipated, but also that they're freely able to exercise the rights they ought to have if they're to be genuine freedmen uh, in, 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 the, in, 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 the, in the full sense of the term. So this is what, so this is kind of, this is the background condition. Uh, Johnson has a lot of leeway. He's doing a lot. Uh, Republicans, both radical and moderates, are quite upset and you know quite annoyed by the course of his action. But until the 39th Congress finally convenes a year after its election in December 1865, there's not much they can do. When it does convene, however, uh, it becomes probably the, along, let's say, the, with, along with the New Deal Congress, uh, and uh, got to get back to John Bingham here. Sorry, guys. I really. I thought these things were in order. Obviously, they're not. Um, famous Ohio congressman. Uh, when it does happen, we get to the adoption of, um, you know, well, the framing of two significant measures that we need to talk about in some detail. One is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and the other is the 14th Amendment. And while doing the rest of the class this morning is to try to say something about their significance and what what begins, you know, what what what, what they attempt to do. So as I say on the outline, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was a, legis a legislative response to the specific problems of protecting civil liberties of freedmen and federal officials, you know, who also need protection, and others acting in their behalf, meaning Northerners is sometimes disparaged as carpetbaggers, but Northerners who come back to the South and want to intervene or act effectively. Uh, in, you know, in support of in defense of African-American rights. So Congress, so in response to presidential reconstruction, which Republican congressmen are deeply critical of, and of course they have no political loyalty to Andrew Johnson at all, since he was a Democrat and now is going to try to do the best to become reelected uh, in, in his own right. So Congress attempts to deal legislatively, to, you know, to frame the first of what will be a number of comprehensive civil rights acts uh, that will you know, effectively advance and develop an agenda of reconstruction. Um, and so I've tried to define on the outline exactly what this does. So, you know, in, in terms of broad objectives, the first thing it wants to do uh, is to correct Dred Scott on citizenship. So I'll go back and think about Dred Scott, you know, arguing that African Americans might be free people, but they weren't really vested with any rights that a white person had to acknowledge or respect or pay deference to. Um, so, the, so the first thing we do, if you look at my little footnote here, is you know, it, the Civil Rights Act has a kind of you know, does have a, you know, a fairly broad set of goals. Uh, it redefines citizenship. Uh, you know, it will make you know, it, you know, like like the like Section One of the Fourteenth Amendment, it will make uh, African American citizens both of the states in which they reside and of the United States in general. Uh, it will provide that all citizens will receive equal protection for persons and property be subject to like punishments. Citizens enjoy equal right to sue, contract, witness, purchase, lease, sell, inherit, or otherwise convey property. Uh, violators of the Civil Rights Act you know, are subject to misdemeanor prosecu prosecutions in federal courts. You're going to create a federal basis of jurisdiction in order to enforce the act against those who are trying to prevent it uh, from taking place. Uh, persons denied civil rights and defendant federal officials could be tried in federal courts. I said that federal judges could employ commissioners the army of the militia to enforce the act. So it's a very strong legislative response to you know the to the you know the problems emerging already uh, in 1865. Uh, and as I note on the outline, you know it does create a strong basis for federal judicial protection, uh, and it does permit military enforcement. So it's a pretty sweeping statute. Um, however, it goes so far against the grain of prior understandings of what the federal system was like. Uh, the kind of you know the embeddedness of a belief that states were essentially sovereign, that remain if not fully sovereign, at least largely autonomous communities. That there's a good deal of anxiety uh, among the Republicans as to exactly what form, uh, excuse me, exactly what authority Congress really has. So there's yeah on the one hand, in terms of its policy objectives, the Civil Rights Act looks great. It's ambitious, deals a number of, number of fundamental issues. Um, if enforced, it would. Carry you know carry carry the movement forward significantly, 
On the other hand, there is some residual anxiety about its authority. So that's what leads us in turn to the drafting of the 14th Amendment. Um, and it's drafting because Section 1 looms so large in American jurisprudence, particularly since the, you know, um, you know, since the second or third, well, third or fourth decades of the 20th century, it's worth trying to make some sense uh, of, what, of what it tried to do. Okay, so turn, turn to the section I have here on the 14th Amendment. So in, let's say, as a complement to the Civil Rights Act, the 14th Amendment was a constitutional measure to entrench a broad definition of citizenship and to affirm the essential quality of rights would, without fully defining exactly which rights, privileges, and immunities were subject to protection. Uh, so it's a broad form. Of course, the 14th Amendment has multiple purposes. Section 1 is uh, one of only five sections. Uh, go, you know, make sure you read the whole text and, you know, in, in my annotated constitution so, so you know it's there. So a number of questions arise about, you know, a lot of 20th, 20th century jurisprudence and constitutional scholarship, you know, a, a kind of, I won't, you can't say a disproportionate amount, but an enormous amount of scholarship has gone into making sense of the relevant terms of the 14th Amendment, of the Section 1 uh, as it finally appears. This is the original version, and you know, if you look at it, you, you know, the version from, well, actually, we're just, what's today, the 5th, 4th? What's today's day? So we're at a kind of quasi-anniversary. Should have met yesterday uh, to commemorate this. So this is, now, this is interesting. The Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to secure the citizens of each state all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, and to all persons in the several states equal protection in the rights of life, liberty, and property. So I think, I think there are a couple phrases we'd want to you know, pick out here. One is the use of necessary and proper, you know, something we're now intimately familiar with uh, because of its long history going back to 1791 and McCullough versus Maryland, the idea that the national government should have a great deal of discretion or national government in general, Congress in particular, should have a great deal of discretion in terms of figuring out which legislative measures are, you know, are necessary and proper uh, to secure the objects here. In this case, the object is to secure a significant measure of legal equality for all citizens. Uh, and then the second thing is we get a kind of, but what, you know, what are the rights we're trying to protect? Well, we get a rather vague reference that kind of echoes the Declaration of Independence, or, or more or strictly speaking, kind of echoes the kind of your basic 18th century understanding of what are the natural rights that we should all enjoy. Life, liberty, and property, of course, in the Declaration is the pursuit of happiness, which is a broader, in some ways, very Jeffersonian concept. Um, so we get, we get kind of two specific echoes in the first version. Um, in one sense, this looks to be quite promising, particularly if you're a nationalist, like as I tend to be. Uh, in the sense that you're, you know you are laying a basis for broad national legislative power, so therefore you might be able to use that power to multiple ends and you know leave it uh, to the discretion of Congress. On the other hand, there's a big problem here, and if you think about where we are in the current state of the American polity today in an age of impasse, you can't guarantee what the majorities are going to look like, so you can't be sure how that power is going to be exerted. You're going to leave a lot to political will. Uh, and of course, one of the striking things that happens by the 1870s, and you know, remains the case uh, to the end of the decade, is that while Republicans certainly retained the advantage in terms of capturing the presidency, uh, the control of Congress, particularly actually the control of the House of Re Representatives, remains deeply competitive. It's one reason, by the way, that, it, that states, you know, why are there two Dakotas when hardly anybody lives in either one? Uh, you know, why, you know why, why, why can't, you know, Wyoming be attached to Idaho or, you know, Idaho to Montana or whatever, uh, is there's a bit of kind of rotten burrows that go into the creation of Republican states at the end of the 19th century. Uh, my colleague Barry Weingast in Poli Sci has written a lot about this. So those states are admitted to beef up, the, you know, the Republican control of the Senate while the House remains uh, more, you know, more, more competitive. Uh, so it kind of so this is kind of promising, but um, you know this is this is framed in the committee of fifteen, a joint uh, fifty member congressional committee, nine from the House, uh, six six from the Senate. I had the dominant guy John Bingham up here briefly and didn't didn't identify him adequately. Doesn't matter, his his portrait won't be on the final, uh, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, so we start with so one part of the Fourteenth Amendment is we start with uh, you know with this formula. formula. Um, and then other questions that arise that would be closely allied to this, you know, at the outset. Um, would you want to include the suffrage? 
you know, if you want to start enumerating rights that will go to African Americans, do you want to include the suffrage in that? So when we think about civil rights, or actually when we think about, here, let's get the, the next version of the amendment up. This is, this is the eventual, this is, you know, the, the final amendment. Um, will kind of help us think about this. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So this is the definitive response to um, the Dred Scott decision, you know, a, a broad, comprehensive assertion of the dual nature of American citizenship. You're a citizen, you we're always citizens at two levels, uh, and so on, and then to protect what the substance of that citizen's right entails, we have the three, in fact, three clauses in the second sentence. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or, or it's important to note it's or, I don't fully understand why, or and not and, the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, uh, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. We talked about that briefly in the context of uh, Dred Scott the other day, uh, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, what's missing here, or what's absent for this, is, is you know, specifically the question of suffrage. Uh, suffrage is not directly implicated, and Northern thinking at the time, certainly Southern thinking at the time, would have said you know, that when we think about the body of civil rights we possess, there is a hierarchy. And the right to, at the very top of the hierarchy will be the two quintessential political rights. The right to vote in elections and the right to serve on juries. And there a genuine question arises here. I think we have to treat this as a genuine question. And it goes back to the, the I think to the idea that you know, to most Northerners, African Americans remain a strange and somewhat alien people. Would newly freed slaves be fully competent to exercise political rights? If you assume that there's some, you know, some hierarchy of abilities or faculties is tied to our capacity to exercise rights. There's a lot of, you know, there's open division within Republican ranks about whether or not suffrage is, is included here. And I think the basic consensus is suffrage has to be provided for separately. We have to have evidence that African Americans are really capable of voting. It sounds pejorative. It sounds, you know, it's, you know, sounds a bit condescending. I'm not going to try to defend it. Uh, it's very quickly done away with by the later Reconstruction Acts, but it was an initial supposition. It doesn't, nobody, you know, most interpreters say suffrage is not included uh, in, in this package. Another issue that arises here uh, is whether or not uh, the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States embrace um, uh, the Bill of Rights. And so, you know, if you take, if we're actually really the first eight amendments, forget nine and ten, uh, enumeration of certain rights and, you know, the, the federalism formula, but all the individual rights embraced and, you know, from the first, first amendment protection of, you know, free exercise of conscience, religion, speech, and so on, uh, down through the eighth amendment. Now, and our big argument's been made here is that it goes back to a famous case called Barron versus Baltimore from 1833, you know, one of the very late cases of the Marshall Court, uh, which argues, which holds that, uh, and you know, people didn't really talk about the Bill of Rights very often in the 19th century. Uh, John Bingham interestingly did. Uh, that case holds that, uh, you know, in effect, um, the Bill of Rights is a limitation only on federal power. You could argue that if you wanted to. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. Right, so the First Amendment clearly is addressed only to Congress. The next seven amendments don't refer either to Congress or the state legislature. So you could argue as a matter of text that maybe it was left open whether or not all the rights protected under the federal constitution from 1791 on might also apply against the states. You could argue that textually, I can suppose with some plausibility, but no one was prepared to argue historically uh, very deeply, and in 1833, the court says that that's not going to work. But there were some Republicans, and John Bingham from Ohio, who we think of as the leading author of you know, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, uh, was, was one of those who argued the opposite. Bingham says, you know, Bingham, at various points, that in fact all the protections of the Bill of Rights really matter. One of the ones that would be most important here, maybe you want to take a guess on this? 
after the First Amendment, in addition to the First Amendment? One that would matter, one would be really significant, 1865, 1866, might be. Allison? It's one we still argue about pretty actively. Habib? Second. The Second Amendment. And the Second Amendment by the middle of the 19th century, you know, I, I've argued, I wrote a brief on this to which I'm quite deeply attached and which uh, Justice Stevens cited in his dissent in the Heller case. Uh, I'm 99 and 44% convinced that the Second Amendment is framed was entirely about the militia and not about an individual right of self-protection. But, it's a big but, by the time you get to the middle of the 19th century, notions of personal self-defense uh, that the Second Amendment might somehow uh, cover or, you know, embrace uh, a right of personal self-defense have become much more common. And in the post-1865 period, they have a real purchase within the African-American community because freedmen are increasingly exposed to all kinds of violence within their communities, violence coming from the Ku Klux Klan uh, or other kinds of, you know, quasi-militia-like groups. So you might argue that embedded, in it, that's one reason actually I didn't sign, there's subsequent litigation over gun rights, the McDonald versus Illinois case. I may have mentioned this previously. Illinois is a very strong anti-gun rights state, has been politically. Uh, so it became a big object of attack. I didn't sign the brief in that case because I think when you're, to get from the, I'm confident about the late 18th century, get the mid 19th century, I'm a lot less certain about how people then would have thought about you know, the, the meaning of the Second Amendment. So anyhow, but that's, so, you know, it's, but this is a big question, of course, because it, it provides, you know, we'll see in you know, a couple of weeks, the question of whether or not Section 1 covers the Bill of Rights or not became the whole basis of what we call the incorporation doctrine, the, you know, the capacity of federal courts, essentially from the 1920s and 1930s on, to apply the, to apply the, 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 the to apply the Bill of Rights against the states. Um, and then another question arises, we've got to wrap this up momentarily, is did, is did the 14th <clears throat> Amendment also create a body of national rights that could be protected against the states? Um, most of the rights we enjoy and exercise come to us, at least previous people thought of the 19th century, before the Bill of Rights was entrenched against the states. Uh, you would say that the great source of all the legal rights we exercise, where we want conditions of equality and due process to apply, are largely determined by state law. Might we want to have a situation in which, in fact, um, we think of rights as being primarily national in nature, and therefore we can use their national authority to trump what the states are left to do? Right. So those are those are broad. You know, those are potentially broad statements. The alternative to this, what I think you know, most scholars would argue, uh, is you know, is, is you know, there are kind of a set of alternatives. This to kind of you know help us to explain what finally comes out of the congressional deliberations of 1866. Um, is, an, is a judgment that's closer to the following. Uh, really, just really two points to be made here. Um, one is, given the choice between leaving Congress free, leaving the national government free to determine what national rights really are, or leaving rights to be, well, this is a bit redundant, but leaving rights to be the province of the state legislatures. That's say, leaving the state legislatures as the principal legal authority that will determine what our rights are. Um, the, the debates, as, as best we can analyze them, I, mean, I rely a lot here on a book by a friend and colleague at NYU, William Nelson's book, The 14th Amendment, which I sometimes, sometimes assigned in this course, um, argues that in the end, the framers of the 14th Amendment in reconstructing the Union err on the side of federalism, meaning they're not, they don't want, you know, they, they still remain sufficiently respectful deferential to the authority of the states. They don't want to trump that. They don't want to derogate from it. They don't want to subtract from it uh, in, in any radical way. So they want to leave the states free to continue to operate as largely autonomous jurisdictions. So you're not going to create a body of national rights that you could impose directly on the states. What you're going to assume instead is that the states will uh, enforce those rights on principles of equality. And here we have actually three notions, and we'll talk more about this on Friday, three notions of what that equality will entail, what are the privileges and immunities that citizens lawfully enjoy, what do we mean by due process of law, uh, what do we mean by equal protection. These are kind of broad formulas that have to be worked out. The last thing that's left open, which gets us back to the political story, is there's a tricky question about how you get the 14th Amendment ratified. How will you get, you know, two uh, excuse me, three-quarters of the states to agree to 
this kind of radical formula, which promises to give the national government a significant basis for acting in behalf of the freedmen uh, within, within, uh, within the southern states. Uh, and that's a tricky proposition because, you know, until you have a black electorate, you're going you're gonna to be electing governments that are still dominated by, you know, the ruling white class, which is still committed to pro-slavery, pro at least pro-racist values. Uh, and so the Republicans, have, the Republicans have to think long and hard about, about exactly what, you know, what, are, you know, what are the circumstances that are going to, that are going to operate here. Uh, and so what, and then what happens is, you know, uh, to be readmitted to Congress, you know, for the Southerners to be able to send their delegations back to Congress, the decision is finally made is that the South is going to have to ratify the 14th Amendment. It doesn't really have free choice on this. If it wants to be part of the union, its, re its, re you know, its ratification is effectively being coerced. And this raises lots of interesting questions about how we think about the structure of American federalism. We'll come back and talk more about it on Friday. Thanks a lot. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.